The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's WCET special member-only webcast. We have quite a bit of content to get through today. I wanted to go ahead and jump right in as we go through the presentation today. If you have any trouble hearing, just put a little note in the, the chat box there and we'll be sure to get to that. Go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. Um, you didn't give me the ability to share oh, as of yet. Okay, let's see. We'll get there. Give keyboard and mouse control. And I, I think that's a separate one for um, Make Presenter. There you go. There we are. Okay. Perfect. So should be sharing now. I'll advance to the next slide. Is that working okay? Perfect. Great. Great. Again, this is WCET's special member-only webcast, scalable and personalized interventions for student health. All right. Next slide. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. And... As we go through today, if you have any questions at all, go ahead and enter them into the question box and we'll be monitoring that. We will hold questions till the latter part of the presentation and then we'll get to your questions. The webcast is being recorded and you will receive a link to the presentation as well as any resources that were shared. If you'd like to follow along, you can download the PowerPoint presentation in the chat box. And if you're an active Twitterer, feel free to comment or ask questions via Twitter, and the hashtag is WCET Webcast. So as we move through today, we'll do brief introductions, and then we'll move to you. <laughs> we were just talking about how inevitably a train was going to go by. We'll talk about the U at College platform, mental health and well-being trends on campus, and then we'll discuss the partnership between U at CSU, U and at CSU and discuss some of those really compelling results. Then we'll get to your Q&A, and then we'll wrap up. Next slide. Again, if you have any questions, do enter those into the question box or the chat box, and we'll be sure to get to those questions. Next slide. And I am your moderator today, as well as the MC. So I'll be helping field those questions. And then we'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. So we have... Great. Thank you so much. Yeah, go ahead. Megan, take sorry. it away. Go ahead, Nathan. Perfect. Thank you. Well, really happy to be here. And thank you, Megan and WCET, for having us. We're really excited about the opportunity to share a lot about our work. Um, so as a quick introduction, my name is Nathan Demers. My background, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm the vice president and director of clinical programs with you at college. And how I got here, I'll give it a short version, but um, I've always been interested in the positive psychology movement, which is the science between how we actually bolster grit and resilience to help people thrive. And with that, and a strong background in college counseling, um, I was lucky enough to meet the right team at the right time and hop on board with this project. And I'll turn it over to Janelle to introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Janelle Petrius. I work at Colorado State University in our integrated student health services. My role is that I oversee our health education, prevention, and outreach as it relates to mental health. I've been in my role for seven years and have been fortunate to be the project lead in our involvement with the U of College tool here at CSU. And just to kick it off, we'd love to just learn a little bit more about all of you. If you're willing to share um, your role, if you're administrator, council, faculty member, student affairs, or other, um, feel free to just respond in that chat function, and we'll look at that as we move forward. And as you're doing that, I know we're sort of throwing two questions at you, which can be a little bit challenging, so sorry about that. But as you're responding, we're also very curious if your campus has ever used a digital health education intervention. And if so, just generally how that went. If it was a positive thing, if it was difficult, if you haven't done it just because um, you're, you're not quite sure how or anything like that. And we'll be monitoring those. And Lindsay or Megan, if there's any that really jump out, please feel free to let us know. But otherwise, we'll let people just read those comments in the, the general chat function rather than trying to report each and every one of those. 
So while you're doing that, we're going to kick things off. And our story and our relationship with Colorado State actually started from a, a very unexpected place. And with that, I'm going to play a quick video. I know video doesn't come together, come through perfectly via GoToMeeting all the time, but hopefully this will work well enough. It, it, it's pretty quick. Welcome to your appointment. Please take a knee. Make yourself comfortable. Now, to help me better recommend manly tips, activities, and resources for you to explore in my office, I'm going to ask you to fill out a questionnaire about yourself, your feelings, and your life. After you finish, I will use my patented man therapy calculator to evaluate your answers and provide you with some suggestions. Oh, and don't shit me. There's nothing I hate more than bull except for maybe shopping malls and spandex. So that's a quick clip from a uh, clip, excuse me, from mantherapy.org. I'm not sure if that's a site that any of you are familiar with, but at a very high level, it's a website that we developed in partnership with the Colorado Office of Suicide Prevention. And as you can tell, it's a very innovative campaign that gets at mental health. And this is the introduction to take the head inspection we have, which is a mental health screening tool. But what was innovative about it was it, it was a confidential and anonymous platform that really used the power of marketing and branding in meeting a select demographic on their terms to get them talking about a challenging topic, in this case, mental health. And of course, um, I was a previous employee of WICHI. We know that that mental health stigma, especially in rural areas, can be extremely difficult to overcome. So Man Therapy had incredible national and international success as a mental health um, well-being platform, if you will, with the ultimate goal of suicide prevention. And that's ultimately what led us to meet um, Colorado State University. And I'll let Janelle um, speak a little bit to that. Yeah, so at the earliest phases of our partnership, we actually engaged with our students to do some testing of the Man Therapy tool. We were interested to see if it actually made sense to bring a tool like that to a college environment. And um, what we found was really fascinating. For the most part, our students thought it was funny, but they also thought it was really built for their fathers, which actually was exactly who it was built for. The target population of, for man therapy is really these middle-aged men. And so our students kind of sniffed that out from the start and said, this doesn't fit for us, but we're actually really interested in a digital tool. And we're interested in a digital tool that's holistic of our college experiences. We don't just want to talk about mental health. We want to talk about everything that's impacting us as students and so that really kicked off and a partnership to be able to work alongside of great digital health from the very beginning and brainstorm and think of ideas and and test it out with our college students and it's been um, a really exciting process so far so just a quick glance at our campus so colorado state university is in fort collins the northern part of the state we have these are last year's numbers we haven't hit our census yet this year but we have around 33,000 students, 28,000 of which are resident instruction. And we have a really high demand, sorry about that, here we go. We have a really high demand in of our counseling services. We're seeing nearly 20% of our student body is using counseling. counseling. And that's not to say that our students are struggling more, but I think we've really um, seen great health seeking attitudes on our campus, but this kind of huge, crunch of students coming in for services is a challenge that we're facing and I'm sure a lot of other schools are facing that as well. And we are an integrated health system as I mentioned. We are really looking at um, how to be upstream with our students around health and resiliency, but also kind of that full gamut of, of serving all students. We are definitely recognizing the impacts of mental health of our students, and I'm sure everyone has seen that on their campuses as well. I mean, if you look at this slide, at least a third of students are being impacted at least weekly, and more than 40% are having mental health impacts on a regular basis the majority of their week. We um, use the National College Health Assessment Tool, which I'm sure a lot of other schools do as well. 
And one of the ones that we're always tracking and I find interesting are what do those factors negatively impact these students' academics? So what is leading to students dropping a class, not making progress towards their degree? And what we see are those top impacts, and many of them involving mental health. In fact, depression edged its way onto the top five back in 2015 and really seems to be holding on steady there. And we see anxiety and depression both negatively impacting academics. And then from there, I think it's very important when we throw around the term mental health, we're not just talking about DSM diagnoses and IDC-10 um, labels, if you will. What we're really talking about is all those hurdles that can get in the way of a student's experience. Some things as simple as adjusting to a new college life, being away from home for the first time. Um, we know that that can be a very vulnerable transition time where one in three nationally is not making it from their freshman to sophomore year. But then we also know that family challenges, relationships, um, traumatic events, the loss of parents or grandparents are also things leading to that. And the only one I'll point out as well is we also know in the literature that loneliness is actually reaching really unhealthy levels. And we know that Gen Z is actually the loneliest demographic or living generation to date. And with that, we know also that the Surgeon General came out saying that the experience of being lonely is the equivalent of smoking about a pack of cigarettes a day. So that's something that we're really pushing the needle and have formed a partnership with a social innovations lab in San Francisco to tackle. As we said a moment ago, that huge um, increase in accessing college counseling is, is definitely being felt at our institution. In the first couple of weeks of this school year, we actually have seen a 25% increase from the same time last year. So that means if you want to put that into some numbers, we had 40 to 50 students walking in our doors um, um, the first few weeks of school asking to see an on-call therapist. All things considered, we're a pretty well-resourced campus. We have a lot of counseling staff. We have a, a really supportive administration. And yet, even though we moved into a new building last year, we're already at a state where we can't add more, more offices to um, fill the need for counselors. So we have to continue to look for new um, digital tools and other ways to support our students. And just to further elaborate on that, as Janelle mentioned, CSU is not alone in this experience and that we know utilization rates have gone up about five times that of enrollment across the country. And what it, it's really spurring is this conversation that this isn't an issue that we can just hire our way out of and that I've worked at campuses that hire an additional five counselors year over year and lo and behold, they still end up on that wait list or running out of office space. And of course, mental health budgets aren't going up five times that of everything else on campus. And when we further look into the, the data, this really presents somewhat of a catch-22 in that we're seeing huge wait lists at the counseling centers and demands that are really difficult to keep up with. But on the other side, we know that 50% of students who drop out due, a, due to a behavioral health condition have actually never accessed on-campus supports for that specific issue. So that, again, was our cue and really where CSU's model is of but we need to go upstream and reach those students prior to the development of some of these crises. And then when we dig even further, and most tragically, we know that suicide has climbed to be the second leading cause of death on college campuses across the country. And when we further dive into that data, we know that about 60% of students who die by suicide have never seen a behavioral health provider. And that data point for myself was really my call to action when I was a, a counselor in my four walls in a college counseling center, we know that we do great work for students once they're able to self-identify. We can provide services in our counseling centers and make those appropriate referrals. But when we think of 60% of students never stepping foot in our centers before literally taking their lives, as tragically as that is, in my opinion, that's unacceptable. And that was my call to action to say, if students aren't coming to us, we need to go to them. And whether we like it or not, one place we know that students spend a lot of time nowadays is with technology. And in doing so, in taking that step, one thing that's incredibly important for, in my opinion, really any health-related campaign in today's society is not going after it single-handedly. So I'm a psychologist. I know behavioral health really well, but I don't know marketing and communications well. I didn't know technology well. I, I'm not an expert, but Obviously, I know a lot more now than your average psychologist. But of course, pulling in experts in user experience and user design who are folks that do nothing but study how individuals interact with technology and how that can shift behavior. 
as well as pulling in the experts in wellness to really be able to work on that upstream approach to get wellness on their radars and do so in a quote unquote cool and approachable way. When we started exploring a little bit deeper about what our students were needing, what we found is that students just need a lot more help navigating their college experience. They're not really sure how to go about getting involved on campus. They don't know what door to walk into to get the support that they need. Our students, you know, whether we like it or not or how we agree with it, they really don't have the same problem solving skills that maybe you or I did at the time that we were going to school. But they're here and, and we need to work with them. And so if we have a lot of resources or even if we don't on a smaller campus, we want to get the students pushed in the right direction. And this is one of the things that you at CSU really can help to do help to do is pointing them it's suggesting in a in a gentle and sometimes an overt way of what they might need to make some changes and of course we know our students are digital natives they want to be connected off at all times they expect to have constant access and connectivity whether that's to people but also to resources and information and no matter what we do to scale our counseling services or any office on campus we are never going to be 24 7 in the same way that our students are experiencing their world we also know, of course, the students are looking online. They want to know the answers, and they want to know the answers right now. And so we, we recognize that they are going to Google. They're going to go to Dr. Google like all of us have honestly done at some point in time. But we want them to look to us first. We want them to know that we can deliver reliable, evidence-based information that's vetted and specific to their college campus. And once you're delivering that tool to them, they're actually really helpful really happy to use it. In fact, one of the early definitions I ever heard a student describe the USCSU tool was they said it was like Google if Google was written by a CSU student. And I think that really captures a lot of what we're trying to deliver to these students. And just an interesting statistic that isn't in here, um, I just stumbled across it yesterday actually, that 85% of students who are in treatment for behavioral health actually looked online for support first. So again, that's just really supporting what Janelle's saying of Dr. Google is a thing, and I think we can do a lot better than Dr. Google. Um, so with that, we talked a little bit about our academic research. Janelle sort of gave the tip of the iceberg of a lot of those focus groups that we did with students, and we were very mindful during that um, research process to get a very diverse group of students involved, because we didn't just want to make it for first years or just make it for grad students. We wanted it to really span the college experience. And these are our key findings when we mush those two things together. So the first thing, as Janelle mentioned, is our initial hypothesis was we wanted to set out to make a mental health fitness center. But students said, you know what, I'm probably not going to use that because it doesn't sound like fun. In fact, it sounds like work. And most importantly, I don't have a behavioral health disorder. Even though we know that students are maybe away from home for the first time, they're having difficulty adjusting to the classroom, they're feeling lonely, so they maybe you're coping with drugs and alcohol, then they're not sleeping, so they're missing class. But again, I don't have a behavioral health disorder. Someone else should be going to the counseling center. So with that, we made the platform to really address all aspects of the student experience. And just going back to my college counseling days, I've also worked with students who are in acute crisis because maybe they do have a background or a previous diagnosis of behavioral health. But I've also worked with students who are in crisis because they failed a test or just experienced a difficult breakup. So we never know which issue might ultimately lead to a student needing additional supports. And then students also said, there's enough crisis lines out there. I'd really rather have some sort of intervention that can help me grow my toolbox so that as the college experience or life in general throws those curveballs my way, I have that arsenal and an arrow in my quiver to be able to address that. And then, not surprisingly, um, students are digital natives, as Janelle mentioned, and making sure that we're matching the digital experience of a Snapchat or a Facebook or an Instagram is really essential. And a, a perfect parallel or analogy is we know that NIMH or the CDC has amazing mental health resources out there. We also know that students, and not even myself, that's not the first place I go when I need support or to look something up because the digital experience isn't quite there. And then these last two pieces are really interesting. The first is that students said, if this isn't confidential and anonymous, I'm simply not going to use it. Because if I'm worried that Janelle or Nathan is going to come knocking on my door, if I endorse, let's say, depressive symptoms or 
um, indicate that I might be struggling with substance use, again, I'm just going to lie to your platform or not use it at all. So we knew we really had to respect that anonymity. And again, that's why students turn to technology as their first level of support, because it's a lot easier to go to Dr. Google than it is to have a conversation with a therapist or a parent or a mentor. And then this last piece, again, seems conf conflictual, but it'll make sense, in that digital natives, everything in their life is personalized, from their music to, sadly enough, their news feeds and the te temperature of their coffee sometimes. And of note, uh, millennials and Gen Z are actually by far the most tattooed generation of all time. And if you want to talk about personalization, in my opinion, that's a, a pretty good example. So with that, we knew that we had to deliver content to students based on their specific identities. Because of course, an international student has a different experience on campus than a student from in-state or a student athlete or a student veteran. And then also the experience on different campuses is different. CSU is different than Wisconsin-Madison, which is different than a small um, community college in a rural area. So those were all tenants that we really had to bake into what we were going to make. So all that research and focus groups really culminated into a three-tiered approach to well-being. And as we mentioned, um, selfishly, our, our motive, of course, was really all around Thrive, which is about physical and mental health. So at the, the highest most level, if you will, it's really suicide prevention, but as we trickle down, that's addressing all those issues related to mental health, the coping strategies, as well as physical health and fitness and nutrition. And then our, our next domain is what we call Succeed, which is all about academic and career success. So that's everything from how do I declare my major to how do I make a budget and how do I ideally end up with a degree that I can have a pursue a meaningful career and pay off potentially these thousands of dollars of debt that I've accrued over the years. And then the last domain is matter. And this one is so important in my opinion. It's all about purpose and connection. It's everything outside the classroom. And when we look at the college experience, we know that students spend about 10% of their time in the classroom and that other 90% is incredibly important. And if I'm a student, even if I'm excelling academically, if I don't feel like I belong on campus or I haven't found that social support group, that can be an indicator or a risk factor of me potentially looking to transfer to find somewhere that maybe I do feel like I fit in more. So this is a way to get students involved on campus, help them find their passions, and really plug into those resources on campus. And then the other piece about this whole platform and what we set out to do is we know every campus in some way, shape, or form is working on well-being initiatives. And we know that in a world of limited time and resources, not everyone can build a world-class digital experience that customizes to unique users. So what we really wanted to do and are doing is we created that back-end amazing digital experience that is constantly innovating and researching, but then we can customize it to each and every campus. And what's really fun about this is we really create an economy of scale because every time we get a new campus partner, that campus, of course, has new ideas and functionalities for content. And as soon as we do and develop that, we can share that with the rest of the partner network. So again, we do the most innovation with CSU as this is where we developed it through a public-private partnership, but everyone really gets to put their thumbprint on the portal in a pretty unique way. So from there, we're gonna switch over and just do a very quick walkthrough of the platform, really just to give you an overview of the experience and ultimately really show how our research turned into a, a thing, if you will. So I'm gonna let Janelle kick us off on that front. All right, so this is our version of the U at College platform. We call it U at CSU. It has a nice ring to it here on our campus. And what you see when any students show up for the first time is they see this beautiful ambient video of our fabulous campus. And it's a way to really make it focused on it being a CSU-specific tool. We were able to work to build the single sign-on technology, which was really important for our campus and our campus partners. It was really cumbersome to have students have to create a new username and a new password, which could be a little bit clunky. So that was one of the things we, we moved towards early on in the process. This also gives us folks a preview. So before they even have to click and decide or make a commitment, they can kind of take a look and see what this tool might have to offer, including goals and reality checks, which we'll talk about more in a moment. And the only other thing I'll add that we were very mindful about is not to have behavioral health front and center in here, because we didn't want students coming to the site saying, 
whoa, 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 behavioral health is not what I signed up for. So it's more about architecting your ultimate college experience. So once they take that first step and they're in the tool, we're just waiting for the pictures to load here. Classic moment. Um. <laughs> yes, that's how it works. And half of that's courtesy to go to meeting and half of that's go. courtesy of our internet connection. All right, we're back on. So what you see right from the start is it's gonna dive people right into the content, which is what we want them to do. We don't want them to have to do a lot of um, clicking or setting things up. We want them just to see what it has to offer right from the start. It has a beautiful interface. It has kind of that Pinterest feel. It's very sleek. You can see what other students are looking at through this trending portion over here, some tips and advice. And also, um, we have anything identified as a campus resource has a nice little cam in the corner, which is our mascot. And so really, right from the start, they know if I click on this, it's going to give me something specific to my campus, which is what they're looking for. And then to jump into how we see a lot of students really navigating the site, what you're not seeing is the onboarding process that orients you to the site, because we'll walk through that. But where we see a lot of students navigating the site is through this sub-navigation. So again, those three domains, the feed, all about academic and career success. So again, everything from how do I declare my major to how do I find a career and internship. And it matters, again, all about purpose, connection, resiliency, mindfulness, getting involved on campus. And then last and certainly not least is Thrive, which again all, is all about physical and mental health. And we're not shying away from those tough topics like loneliness and depression and suicidal thoughts because we know that one in 12 students actually experiences suicidal ideation during their time on campus. And we want to normalize that experience so students can actually reach out for support. And narcissistically, as a psychologist on our team, and I think Janelle's in this book too, we know that most of our users come into the site through succeed or matter because, of course, it's approachable and quote unquote acceptable to be stressed about academics. But when we consistently look at our data, Thrive tends to be by far the most viewed. And when we dive a little bit further, it tends to be stress, anxiety, depression, how to help a friend I'm worried about, sleep, not surprisingly, is up there, and then Career Center for folks um, looking for a job as they get closer to the, the end of their degree. So jumping into the content, we have two main buckets, which we already alluded to, but we're just going to really um, highlight a little bit more of. So the first type of content is what we call universal content. And what that means is this is content that applies to any of our, any student at any of our campus partners. So whether it's a quick video on coping or a video on the difference between sadness and depression or what to expect at therapy, that's something that we're bringing to the table to expand your resources as a campus. And then the second type is campus-specific resources, which Janelle already alluded to. And the importance of this, and I'll let Janelle elaborate, is that we know when a student is, for example, stressed, the first place they're not necessarily going is the Health Center website. So I'll let her pick up right there if that works. Yeah, absolutely. And we don't necessarily want everyone to come to our website, and we certainly don't want everyone to always come in the doors of our health center, as I mentioned before. We want to meet those students who are in crisis and struggling, but we want to equip students and empower them to do some of their own skill building and let them know that there are tools and resources they can actually learn about themselves that will benefit them. Sorry, our, our internet's a little bit slow here, but stress actually is one of the most frequented searches that we see students conducting. And as, a, as an administrator of this tool, I can actually see the back end and, and be able to see what we call the dashboard functionality. So I can see what students are, are using in an aggregate form. I can never know what one specific student is doing, which is important. Nathan mentioned this earlier, that students want a confidentiality and, and, a minute, and a anonymity, but I also do as an administrator. I can't have the liability of knowing the student Jane is actually searching on depression and suicide every day. I can't know that and not have an intervention for that student or that outreach. So it protects both the students and the um, university by having that really clear kind of firewall in between. So here's a quick look at all of these different skills and resources and tools that are available for students that are maybe struggling with stress. And it's putting some of those campus resources, the groups and the workshops that might be available to them um, we want to certainly promote those to them as best as possible, but we also want them to do some of their own self-work. And the only other thing I'll add on that front is that we know campuses have a wealth of resources, and at times they can be difficult to navigate, whether it's multiple portals or a directory that lists by the title of, an, of a resource rather than the function. 
So this is a really robust search function that lets students search for anything from stress to I want to find an internship to how do I register for classes. So it's that one-stop shop that we can create that culture for students to come here and they're getting both those nationally vetted resources and that proprietary content that we've developed as well as all those campus specific resources in the mix. And then from there, as we mentioned in the research, personalization is a key tenet of the platform. And I'm gonna let Janelle talk a little bit about that. So this is what students are interested in. They wanna upload their picture, we know that. And so giving them the opportunity to do that, even if it's truly for their own, own benefit, they're the only ones that will ever see it. But the sneaky part about this is it's using the profile actually helps drive the right content to the right student. So there's a, a algorithm on the back end, which I certainly don't pretend to understand, but what it's doing is it's been populating their, the top of their feed with the, those resources that are most relevant to some of their experiences. So if it's a first year student, they might be getting different content than our, our graduate students. We also do this so that we can build out specific content to different um, groups of identities for students, different shared interests for students, so that anyone can really see themselves in the portal at any given time. And they're prompted to complete their profile, and then that will just help personalize their experience for them. And just to be the psychology nerd that I am, um, this is so important because we know the more that we can speak to individuals' identities, the more likely they are to actually access a resource. If I'm a veteran and I'm seeing resources and tips for veterans in college, the likelihood of me following through and looking that resource is so much higher than if it was just tips for any old college student. So the more we can do that, the more likely we are to get students to engage and the more likely they are to come back because the platform, again, is reflecting those identities. Can you click on one of those cards, maybe tips for veterans? Yeah, absolutely. So here's the other thing that I wanted to mention is that the content is delivered in a bite-sized way. We know students aren't going to spend, you know, 10, 20 minutes reading the latest scientific article. So if we can condense the really important pieces for them and put it in this short little bulleted list, I think that's pretty ideal. And when you scroll to the bottom, what also I think is really great is it's going to recommend other related resources. So it's kind of like when you're shopping on Amazon and it recommends, hey, maybe you want to look at this too. And so students might be going in for one thing, but they're using this kind of propelled suggested content to dive deeper and deeper into resources that maybe they didn't even know they were looking for. So we've joked a lot about the mental health related resources are kind of like hiding the vegetables. They might come in for one thing, but lo and behold, they learned a tip about sleep that will only benefit them more in the long run. A great point. Thank you for that, Chanel. And just to really belabor the point, because I think it's a great one, we know students aren't reading Harvard Medical Journal in their spare time for some light reading. That's just not what happens. So what we're able to do is, I'm just going to do a direct search and cheat because I know exactly what I'm looking for. But we go to, for example, Harvard Medical Journal and take that long, dry, boring article and boil it down, pun totally intended, to 100 or 150 words, where students then can base their behaviors off the most up-to-date research from Harvard without going to that original source. And if a student does really want to learn more, we always make sure to have that link so that they can dive in and really get as much out of it as they would like, should a student wish to do so. And then there's one other area that we really personalize the platform. So the profile you can think of of getting a snapshot of who an individual user is. And these, what we call reality check assessments, get at how that individual is functioning. So I'm just going to jump into the Thrive reality check because we, we're sort of focused on mental and physical health as a big part of this conversation. It's a high-level screening tool that's getting a snapshot of how a student's doing in this area. And as you can tell right off the bat, it's more like taking a BuzzFeed quiz than it is taking a PHQ-9 when you walk into your doctor's office. Yet we are asking those tougher questions about body image. We get into self-esteem, substance use. And of note, as Janelle alluded to, we also do ask a very direct question about self-harm and suicidal ideation. And if a student endorses any level of acuity, again, while we don't get that notification on the back end as administrators, that student immediately gets a pop-up which recommends that they connect to on-campus supports or a local walk-in center, or with one click, they could immediately start chatting with a trained crisis counselor from Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So again, we're making it never more than one click away for a student who might be experiencing a level of acuity to be able to get to that resource. 
And as soon as a student finishes these assessments, they get a quick assessment, uh, excuse me, report card, if you will. I hate using the word report card, but they get some feedback. And it takes a very strengths-based approach to say, these are the areas you're doing great in, and by all means, keep it up and access more resources to make sure this can be a personal strength. But on the other side, what we're doing in a very approachable way is providing students a feedback that says, you know, these are some areas that you should probably put some thought and time towards so that it ultimately doesn't lead to some consequences down the road related to your college experience, your academics, your relationships, or your health. And then with one click, a student can get to all those resources based on who they are as an individual user from their profile, as well as how they just filled out that tool. And again, that gives resources that we've vetted across the internet, as well as those specific campus resources. Anything to add on that, Chanel? I would just add that students actually do the reality check. So sometimes we, we create a tool and we want students to use it a certain way and they, they don't. But the good news is they actually do complete the reality check. So um, that is helping them really personalize that. And it's not necessarily something they're going to do you know, um, every single semester, but as they progress through their time at our college, maybe they are going to be updating those reality checks from time to time, and we just know that that will help customize their experience. And the nice thing about how this then shuffles all the parts to them is it's both strengths and deficit focused. So if body image is actually an area of, of strength for a student, that means they're probably interested in learning more about some of those resources. So it's actually gonna shuffle some of these cards for them, and they're going to see more and more content relating to body image and nutrition, as well as areas that they're struggling, like maybe perhaps sleep or anchor. Thanks, Janelle. And then the last piece, which Janelle already alluded to, but we'd love to really show you the back end of it, is the analytics dashboard. So I'll yeah. let Janelle take it away. Great. So this is something we were really interested in from a university standpoint. Is I want to know what my students are actually doing, what they're looking for, and how they're engaging with this tool. So from here, we can see pretty quickly of what were students doing during September of last year till to present. And it gives us kind of a quick snapshot. What are some of those cards that they're frequently using the most? Actually, clubs and organizations is right there at the top of the list. They're trying to figure out how do they engage in campus. And one of the things we actually learned by using this dashboard is that we found out that first-year students prior to, between their time of orientation in the summer, before they actually set foot on campus, their activity in the portal was very high. And they were looking at just these type of things. What is, how am I going to hit the ground running when I come to school? And what are some of my anxieties? And so you could see through the searches, you could see their activities of what they were doing. We can also filter this out and see what are, what are our male students doing? and just be able to look at them specifically and find out um, is there something unique and different about female students in their third year compared to um, the whole demographic. And I think that's been really interesting to get a snapshot in time, any moment in time, of how students are doing. And putting on my outreach hat as a psychologist where I think it's really interesting is we can do some really fascinating research as our campus community grows and that we can say, you know, there's more issues related to X or Y at a community college than a state school, than a private liberal arts school, or the North, Northeast versus the Midwest, or whatever that might be. So there's some real power in this data, while also maintaining that confidentiality and anonymity. And I know WCT being this type of crowd, to be very clear, we have no interest in sharing that data with anyone else besides the institution and using it for our own research purposes. So that is totally off the table. Um, just to answer that proactively. And there's a number of other bells and whistles in the portal. We're going to switch out of it, but you can favorite content, you can share content. There's a goals tracker that we're actually building out the functionality of with CSU in the coming months. But um, with that, in the interest of time, we're going to jump back over, and during the Q&A, we can jump back to any areas that folks were interested in learning a little bit more about. So with that, we'd love to just talk about the impact and some of the evaluation behind the portal. And I'll let Janelle kick that topic off. Yeah, so given that this tool was so new and we were piloting it for the first time, we were the first institution, we were still trying to figure out how students are going to use it and what they're going to get out of it. One of the, a few of the key performance indicators that we identified, we were really thrilled to see we were actually meeting those, those key performance indicators. And the first one is that students are actually learning about new campus resources. 87% of students, in fact, that have my use with you, the U portal, I'm learning about a new campus resource. And 
and what's really important to note here is we're not just trying to drive all students to counseling services. That is not our intent. We are trying to distribute students to all points in the campus where we know there are people and programs and services that can help them. And when it suggests a campus resource to them versus them having to go out and find it, they're actually much more likely to engage in taking the next step to making appointments and, and going to see folks that they need. We wanted to also to focus on skill building and putting skills and tools right in their hands. And so 76% of students reported that actually their engagement in the tool helped them learn new tips to manage their stress, which we know has obviously has such a huge impact. And this whole idea of empowering students to focus on their strengths and their deficits and, and how they're kind of engaging in their time at school we see so many of them are really learning something new. They're engaging them in that self-exploration that we don't always pause and take time to do. So we felt really encouraged to see these numbers and they continue to be consistent um, at different points in time that we're surveying our students. So these are some of our stats just to share with you. So we actually launched in February 2016. So we are now in our sixth semester here on campus. We've had over 50,000, 58,000 unique users. And that is uh, obviously a huge portion of our campus, including our staff and faculty who are becoming aware of what this tool has to offer. You can actually filter out and, and um, identify in your profile that you're a staff and faculty member. And what that helps you do is that now you're just better able to know how to make those referrals yourself. What we learn from faculty is they are caring and compassionate and they want to support their students, but they don't always know what those resources are. And so knowing that this tool can actually um, support everyone on campus is really helpful. Our time on site is around almost, almost four minutes, which is a pretty long time actually for a, a website for people to be engaging, which also tells us, and you can look further into the analytics, they're actually reading those articles. They're actually you know, doing the reality checks. They're spending the time digging in and using the content as it was as it was designed. Right now, we have about 20% are repeat users, and part of that is because we have really continued to in introduce it to so many new students on a regular basis. We saw a huge spike in our utilization this past spring when we were able to engage with the single sign-on system for our university and also made it a part of our um, student portal. So we call it RAMWeb here on our campus, but it's where students are registering for classes, where they're paying their bills, and having it front and center on that, that tool helps to really boost the credibility of it and boost the visibility. We actually saw a 700% increase when we were able to add it to our RAMWeb tool. So I think as new schools are starting out, making sure that they're integrated in places that you know students are always already going to. And a couple other data points from a survey we did this past spring semester. We know that the majority of students, over 60%, are saying that having this portal really makes me feel like my institution cares and supports my needs as a student. And why that's so important, when we look at some of the data from the Healthy Minds Network from the University of Michigan Depression Center, who polls about 50,000 students a year, we actually know that over half of students are saying that my campus did not support my needs, uh, my mental health needs, in a way that was receptive to me. So this is something that we're very proud to really be meeting students on their terms, which whether we like it or not, um, technology is a great way to do so. And then the other piece, and I think this one's really powerful, is that we made the portal to adopt a comprehensive approach so that each and every student, excuse me, so that the portal had utility for each and every student. And when we look at what students are getting out of the portal, we see that a number are simply feeling more connected to campus. But then we dig down and we see that almost 40% are specifically learning about physical and mental health, while over a third are learning about study habits and identities different from their own as well as bolstering friendships and learning about substance use. So that's how we get that high level of engagement and why students are not just coming to it, but they're coming back to it as they grow and develop throughout their time on campus. One of the last things I wanted to share with you is just some encouragement that um, our students are, are grateful that they have this tool. They actually tell us and, and tell our administrators, wow, this is so cool that you built this for us. And that's the funny thing is, Students absolutely wholeheartedly believe that Colorado State University developed this tool for them. They have no awareness that this is a partnership with Brit Digital Health. They don't know, nor do they really care, to be quite frank. But that is actually such a good thing for us because that just 
really goes to this idea that they know that this is credible and it's de determined and developed and delivered by their university. So we do a lot of things to intentionally involve our students in that. We want our student leaders, um, whether that's our, our resident assistants or our student government, to really um, have this sense of ownership. So we are promoting it through our social media channels and, and really delivering it as a campus institution, institutional um, tool. But then to see our student government, which is, we call it Associated Students of Colorado State University, ASDSU, they actually independently wrote legislation to support this tool. They wanted to put their own money towards promoting you at CSU. And I think that is a real testament to how students embrace something like this on their campus. And I have every reason to believe that this would be everyone's experience using it. Great, and Megan, I think we'll turn it over to you for this. Great, thank you so much. We had a couple questions come in, but I just want to jump into a few slides here. So. We just announced here at WCET who the 2018 WOW awardees are, and one of those was this exact platform, you at CSU, and the award recognizes outstanding efforts by our members and organizations that are applying an innovative technology-based solution to a challenging educational need. And we'll be rolling out more blogs to share some of the good practices of the other awardees. But we did want to just acknowledge that this is an exceptional partnership and congrats to you at CSU. Next slide. So now I'd like to get to the questions that were asked as the presentation was going on. If you have any other questions, feel free to enter them into the question box and we'll be sure to get to those. But the first question is from our friend Kim Bradford. She asks, is there any customization for 100% online students? And that is a lot of our audience here at WCET. Many, many of our institutions just serve fully online students. So those that never come to campus, what sort of resources and customization are available? Yeah, so we do have a good body of resources for online students. For example, how to stay on track, how to set milestones, how to balance being an online student with work. Um, but that being said, we have not had our fully first online institution come on board. And again, what's fun about the platform is whenever we onboard a, a new type of campus, for example, we're going to be onboarding our first medical school campus, when we do that in the customization and onboarding process, we really build out that body of content for that specific demographic, leaning on that campus a little bit to say these are the areas that we really would like to see that content built out in. So we absolutely welcome the opportunity and we have every reason to believe that the platform will be just as powerful, if not more powerful, for an online student because they don't have those brick and mortar uh, resources to turn to. I think the thing I would add to that is that reminder that there is universal content. So what that means is there might be fewer, um, your, you know, an online school might have fewer campus resources that they're highlighting because students aren't going to be walking physically into a door, but there is still a huge proportion of content that is relevant to all students everywhere. And then they are, we're just really invested in building content specific to um, the needs of a certain student group. So I think Students who are using this online would also feel the relevancy for that. Great, thank you. And I just wanted to mention that we jumped into this partnership with you at college because we were hearing from our members that they're really looking for ways to serve students that are fully online and there's more and more demand, as you all know, for behavioral health services. So we reached out to Nathan through um, We've known each other for a while since he worked at Witchy previous to this project, so we thought this was a really great opportunity to bring this compelling work and data and platform to our members. The other question that we had is, at what point are students given access and is it required for our new students? So that's a great question. So what we have really been intentional about is getting access to students and really helping them learn about this tool through the orientation process. But once we started to move toward the, towards the single sign-on, actually as soon as a student had an EID and a login and that password, they had access to the, to the site. And so we actually learned um, kind of on accident, to be quite honest, that students were using this tool before they had even fully become a student of the university. So early in that admissions process, actually, 
students were gaining access to the tool. So we're really interested in talking to our partners in admissions and saying, hey, can we capitalize on this? Would this actually be a way to help persuade incoming students? Aside from that, we're, the intentionality really begins through the orientation process for our first year students. We actually talk about it in um, our convocation as a welcome to, to new students. And we do think this has a ton of applicability to our first year students who are just for the first time learning about such a big campus, but at no point in time is it ever considered mandatory for anyone. Great. And we have a few more minutes, so if you have questions, go ahead and enter them. I did want to note that there was a comment in the chat box that this was a great presentation and the participant's daughter is actually attending CSU and agrees it's been very helpful. Yay, go Rams. Yeah, go Rams. Okay, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. And again, if questions come in, please enter them and we will address them. But this is the one of the exciting parts of the webinar that WCET is really pleased to announce that to our WCET members who are current members, UIT College has agreed to waive the customization to integrate the platform with your institution's website. So this is this is really great news. I hope you find it to be of tremendous value as well. The discount is valued at over up to $10,000. And if you want more information, if you just want to have a preliminary conversation with Nathan, his contact information is there. And we'll be sending out an announcement to our news list later this afternoon as well. Next slide, please. Okay, and if next slide again. Oh. Yeah, next slide. Additional content there for if you want to follow up with either Janelle or Nathan. And then I just want to mention that if you haven't been to the WCET website, we have so much good content being housed on our website. So visit the website, learn more about what our focus areas are. We have tons of really good resources that we compiled. So be sure to visit the website if you haven't been there in a while. Next slide. And Nathan and perhaps Janelle will be able to join us are going to be at the WCET annual meeting and we hope that you will be too. The registration is still open. We're narrowing in on our registration max so if you're thinking of registering please do so. You won't want to miss our 30th annual meeting and celebration and we have some very very good presentations so be sure to peruse the program. The link is there. Next slide. This webcast was recorded. You will receive a link shortly after the presentation, and then we will also post it to our YouTube channel and make that available. So uh, the benefit is exclusive to WCT members, but we think that the content is worth sharing more broadly. Next slide. And then I just wanted to take a minute to thank our supporting partners, including Colorado State University, and then I wanted to quickly jump back to the questions because we still have some time. So there were two more questions so far. The first is, for the content, I would assume campus-specific content is something the, the university would be able to create. For the universal content, was this something CSU created or that came with the program? So I can start to talk about that a little bit. Absolutely. Um, every campus is involved in helping to identify the specific um, campus-specific content, and we're always getting requests from our campus partners, which is a, a really good sign of, of campus involvement and engagement, is, hey, I have a new program, can you build me a, a card? So we're able to do that. One thing to note is I don't have the back-end um, ability to create my own content, and to be quite honest with you, that's exactly how I want it. I don't want to have the content management system available to me because that just sounds like more work. So what I like to be able to do is to put all that information, send that off to Nathan and their team, and they will very quickly create a new card for me. We also suggest to them all the time different universal content pieces that maybe we would like to create or our campus partners have been creating. I just had a, a, one of our campus um, advisors who works with undeclared students, he started writing some really great guidance on how to declare a major and how to make some decisions on that. And so then we were able to send that off and say, hey, if you want to make this universal content, that would be great. And so it's really just this joint process of sharing ideas, but we certainly don't have to do that. I did not create the universal content, but I did review all of it. <laughs> I wanted to make sure that it did speak to our campus. And I think that that's something that everyone can make 
make some, some changes to it. So if there's something that's universal content that doesn't speak to how maybe you talk about something on your campus, you can really easily turn that card off. And the only piece I'll add, of course, with Colorado State, we built this from scratch. So it was a little bit different. So how we do it when we onboard new campuses is we have essentially a, a really glorified spreadsheet that has all the quote unquote normal resources most campuses have. So, you know, club sports, career center, counseling center, and we ask you to give us the URL for each of those resources. And then we actually go and write that content using a student voice with our writers so that it really matches the student voice. And that also takes the burden off of you to develop all that content. But as Janelle mentioned, if you have ideas or you have a professor working on something really interesting, we can absolutely pull and develop a content card specifically for that. Thank you for the question. Great. The last question is, is the phone content accessed through a website or is there a mobile app? Um, so there's not a native app, but the site is fully web optimized. So we actually built it as a web app. Um, I can actually just illustrate that really quickly. Um, but interestingly, to date, we've actually had about 85% of our use on laptops. And when we dive down and look at a little bit more or do some evaluation with students, what they've told us is that if I'm looking up a quick club or mentor or study tip, that's something I'll do on my walk across campus. But if I'm taking a, a depression screening or looking up something more sensitive, that's something I do in the comfort and privacy of my dorm room. And then we also know that students spend a lot of time on laptops, whether it's doing readings, going to Blackboard, taking tests, and things like that. So students simply spend a lot of time on laptops. And it is very mobile friendly. So the mobile version is beautiful and elegant and works great. We actually promote it on all of our posters and campaigns as the mobile version so that we're reminding students that they can actually use it on their mobile devices. But yeah, if, every time we look back at the analytics, they are still using it on their computers at home or, or wherever they are. That's highly interesting. Great. Nathan, if you would go to the last slide, please. Yes, I'd be happy to. And I just wanted to make a plug to visit the WCET webcast webpage, and I just put the link in the chat there. We have three webcasts coming up, two next week. One is on how you can re-engage stop out students. The other is if it's going to be a really interesting conversation with three community college leaders about if you could hit the reset button on your online program, what would you do differently? And then towards the end of the month, we have a webcast on academic integrity and cheating cartels. So be sure to visit the website and register for those. And finally, I just wanted to thank our WCET annual sponsors that underwrite much of our programs and events here at WCET and make much of our work possible. So. Thank you all for being ongoing WCET members. Thank you for your attention and your questions today. And thank you so much to Nathan and Janelle. We really appreciate you walking us through this content and the good work that you're doing to serve your students. With that, and we back at you. Thank you for organizing, sorry, and thank you everyone for attending. That thanks all.